What does it say? Wet and windy. That's a barometer! This is the second installment of a series of videos focusing on the career and work of Laurel and Hardy. I released this video a few months back, but as I'm planning the third chapter of this series, I wanted to add some more detail that I feel I left out in the previous version of this video. In the first video I did in this series, I highlighted the history behind Laurel and Hardy's almost accidental pairing, as well as their seemingly effortless transition from silent shorts to sound. In this video, though, I'll be exploring their leap to feature films, and the wonderful, elaborate productions that would follow. As the 1920s were coming to an end, Laurel and Hardy were proving to be one of the biggest comedy acts of the decade. And not just in America. They were becoming just as popular in other countries. So much so, that they were even recording foreign language shorts. And as this was before audio dubbing, Laurel and Hardy actually re-recorded several of these shorts, speaking in Italian, Spanish, French, or German. As they couldn't really speak these languages fluently, they had to learn their lines phonetically, with a dialogue coach. What's the matter? I'm scared. There's nothing to be afraid of. Or get the endless. Tango Nieto. But almost as accidental as their pairing, their foray into feature films would come about just as accidental. In 1931, producer Hal Roach had the idea to make a prison short starring Laurel and Hardy, reusing the set from MGM's The Big House. But when Roach and MGM couldn't come to terms on borrowing the set, Roach decided to have his own version built. And as a result of having this new massive sandbox to play in, Laurel and Hardy quickly went over budget and behind schedule, shooting enough material to fill three shorts. So Roach decided his duo would make the transition to feature film stars, and their first movie, was born. Pardon Us isn't a perfect movie, especially technically, it's a little uneven at times, but it's enjoyable for what it is. Their characters would continue to grow and their comedy would evolve to work better in the feature film format. This new chapter of their careers didn't stop them from perfecting the art of short film production either, with one of their shorts, The Music Box, even winning an Academy Award in 1932. Of all the dumb things! <laughs> <laughs> but while most of their shorts focused on simple comedy scenarios, they reserved their feature films for larger-than-life stories, with some of those movies even being set in different time periods, countries, and even worlds. Take for instance their elaborate 1933 film, The Devil's Brother, a 90-minute comic opera based on Fra Diavolo. It's a great example of how Laurel and Hardy knew their limitations as a team. Even though their characters take up most of the film, they also allow plenty of breathing room for their comedy, interjecting a romantic subplot and musical numbers in between their scenes. Hal Roach would direct the musical dramatic elements of the film, while Charlie Rogers would work with Stan Laurel to direct the scenes of him and Hardy. <laughs> These two vastly different styles should not work very well together, but they come together flawlessly. leading to two more comedy operas much like it. The Bohemian Girl in 1936. Give me part of the banana. Uh, 
and what is considered to be one of their most popular films, Babes in Toyland, in 1934. This movie is usually shown around the holidays, and it's complete with toy soldier armies, terrifying bogeymen, and equally, although not as intentionally terrifying, fairy tale creatures. <laughs> These movies laid the groundwork for a lot of other comedy teams in the future, like Abbott and Costello. Now, does that penetrate? I'm getting a whiff of it. <laughs> if the prison set in Pardon Us represented a sandbox, these immersive, otherworldly sets represented virtual beaches for Laurel and Hardy to play in. In their feature films, Laurel and Hardy also used their comedy to deal with serious subjects, using the outbreak of war as a story device. And some of their movies would even deal with elements of death. After you're gone, do you want to be buried, or, or shall I have you stuffed? Well, I think that I'd rather... <laughs> what do you mean, stuffed? What have I got to jump in there for? I'm not in love. So that's the kind of a guy you are. After all I've done for you, you let me jump in there alone. Do you realize that after I'm gone, that you just go on living by yourself? People will stare at you and wonder what you are? I guess this is a good place to mention also that their shorts sometimes had really dark, twisted comic endings. Stan Laurel apparently loved this type of humor, and it shows in a lot of their shorts. They also kept topping themselves with new physical comedy bits that rivaled some of their most talented peers. It's amazing that for each one of these great feature films, they also continually put out great short subjects as well. Would you mind opening the window? Not that one, this one! But for their most popular feature film, Laurel and Hardy would return to simplicity with Sons of the Desert. With no romantic subplot or big musical numbers, Sons of the Desert showcases Laurel and Hardy at their best. A simple plot, great comedy writing, and terrific supporting characters. I bet you don't grow flowers out there that smell like this. Oh. <laughs> That's a dub, isn't it, boy? As much as Laurel and Hardy deserve the credit for their success, their films were aided with a string of supporting players, both behind and in front of the camera. These actors knew how to play off Laurel and Hardy perfectly. Actors like Mae Bush. <laughs> Charlie Hall. And of course, their most popular foil, James Finlayson. Uh oh. Take a look through that. Is it true that he's dead? Well, we hope he is. They buried him. No man living can call me an overstuffed pollywog and get away with it. All right, all right. You're not an overstuffed pollywog. Well, that's better. You're an inflated blimp. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> oh! By nineteen thirty five, Laurel and Hardy were now accepted as movie stars with the short subject business no longer being as lucrative or popular. Thus, with some reluctance, they filmed their final short in 1935, signifying the end of an era. Well, here's another nice mess you've gotten me into. Mm. Well, I could the doctor me But just as they had adapted to sound, Laurel and Hardy had adapted just as well to feature films. They got so good at acting off each other in their movies, that for 1936's Our Relations, they would not only play their usual Laurel and Hardy characters, but also their less fortunate twin brothers, Bert and Alf. Oh. 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 
I watch this film now and I'm amazed at how well it works technically, especially for the time. <laughs> Pardon me, officer. Me too. It's all right. While Stan Laurel believed the duo should have never stopped making shorts, they would achieve even more acclaim as they continued to make these movies. They followed up their final short with one of their most beloved films, 1937's Way Out West, showing audiences that their best work might be ahead still. But as successful as their movies were, things were not going so well behind the scenes. Stan Laurel was growing frustrated with the lack of control he was receiving on their films. This tension between the star and producer would eventually lead to Laurel splitting from the studio in 1939. Roach maintained separate contracts on Laurel and Hardy, which limited their freedom as a team. Looking to divide the act up further, Roach even cast Hardy in a film with Harry Langdon, an attempt to form a new team. Audiences, however, did not buy this attempt, and Laurel and Roach came to a new agreement. But as the decade was coming to a close, and with a hint of resentment towards their boss, Laurel and Hardy still turned in some of their most acclaimed feature films. A lot of their later Hal Roach movies focus a lot more on comedy scenarios rather than large stories. Why don't you put some ice in it? In Blockheads, for example, the boys would showcase some of their most surreal comedy to date, as well as some of their best pantomime gags. In A Chump at Oxford, we would get to see what a great actor Stan Laurel was, when he gets to portray his character's alter ego. That's better now. Now throw, throw your shoulders back. That's right. Now uh, chin up. Chin up. No, 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 no. Both of them. Both. It's also worth pointing out that in 1939, they would make their first starring movie independently of Hal Roach, as he lent the team to RKO for The Flying Deuces. It's sort of a remake of their earlier film Bohunks, but it adds a ton of new scenes as well, allowing Stan and Ollie to test the waters outside of Hal Roach Studios. <laughs> With 1940 beginning a brand new decade and a new contract, Laurel and Hardy knew better than to renegotiate with Roach, turning in their final film for the studio, Saps at Sea. Again, it's a fun movie, but it doesn't prioritize a big story, it's more just about a bunch of comedy scenes strung together with a loose plot. And so, when filming was completed, for the first time in their careers, Laurel and Hardy packed their bags and left Hal Roach Studios for good, with the exciting prospect to make movies their own way on the horizon. But what seemed like a good idea at the time would actually lead to the final chapter in the careers of this amazing team. But I've got one more chapter left, and we'll be exploring that in another video. Here's another nice mess you've gotten me into. <laughs> If you enjoyed this Laurel and Hardy video, I did want to recommend another video I have done on the duo. I made what's basically a recut of their final film, Atoll K. You can check the video out here yourself and find out more about the project. I'll be talking a lot more about Atoll K in the eventual third video in this series. Thanks so much for taking the time to check out this video.